Bible is creased already in that passage, so I can easily flip. I hit it, and oh, ooh, I'm spiritual. It popped right there. No, it's creased. Um, up until this point, we've been looking at, as we've continued through Matthew to see, as Matthew portrays Jesus from the perspective of the fulfillment of prophecy, of the, of the, from the perspective of, yes, being the king of the Jews, the one who fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies. And now we come down to the end. He's now, as we saw last week, in the Garden of Gethsemane, crying out to the Father, surrendering his will to the will of the Father. And now, at the end of that, the arrest and trial, as we'll look at part of that today. You know, much has to do here as we see the trial beginning, as we see the betrayal, much of it has to do with people trying to handle Jesus. You see, Jesus came, and actually, as the first chapter of Matthew tells us, that he came, that he would save his people, and he's called his name Jesus because he would save his people from their sin. In fact, the purpose of God was that he, in his coming, was that he might deal with our sin. And as Romans 8, 28 through 30 tells us to be conformed to his image, to become like him, to become born again and transformed to save us from our sin and save us from the wrath, the righteous wrath of God that was due our sins and to bring us into a relationship with him. But there are people, there have always been people, there are that have had a hard time with this and that in some way want to handle Jesus. It's like, okay, this, we have all of this. We have the scripture that says everything about him, but at the same time, they want to deal with it and not being willing to accept it because they're not willing to deal with their own sin. So they try to handle Jesus in one way or another. And today we're going to be looking at two people, basically, and how they tried to handle Jesus and what they did and how it played out. And as actually this morning, it kind of struck me as I was, you know, again, thinking about this, both of these people who tried to handle Jesus both ended up committing suicide in the long run. Jesus would not fit into their molds. Jesus would not be controlled. And she, the question for us is, you know, am I in some way trying to control the Lord or am I, which is kind of a incongruous statement there, oh, how can I control the Lord? If you're trying to control him, he's obviously, you're not surrendering to him as Lord. But, you know, we have this different circumstances. In different circumstances, we have this uncomfortableness, and we want to control the situation. Rather than surrendering to the Lord in the circumstance and looking for what he wants in it and praying through that circumstance. Instead, we get, in our minds, the way things should go, and we try to do it. Here we begin with, obviously, Judas Iscariot. In verses 47 through 56, in the betrayal and how, you know, how Jesus is betrayed on purpose. Now, I kind of titled this section that because, 
yeah, he was betrayed, but, and, you know, again, it's Judas thinking he's in control of the situation, that he's doing it, but God's the one who's in control, and he's the one who's working out his purpose in this situation. So as we begin here with verse 47, start by looking at 47 through 49, where it reads, And while he was still speaking, referring to Jesus as he was, you know, he came back from praying, and he says to his disciples, you know, get up, let's get going here, my betrayer is coming. And, and so as he's still saying this, as he's still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, come from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Ooh. I don't know about you, but just that last verse totally disgusts me. Just the idea, you know, imagine to betray, well, we'll get to it. I'm going to get ahead of myself if I go that way. But as Jesus is telling them about these things, along comes this mob that is guided by Judas. Now, this multitude included temple guards and their auxiliary guys who would help them out, along with a company of Roman soldiers to keep, probably to keep a riot from breaking out. And this is according to uh, John chapter 18, verses 3 and 12. Now, a company of Roman soldiers could be up to 600 men. And they came with swords and clubs to interesting to me, arrest the Prince of Peace. The Jewish leaders wanted to be sure that Jesus didn't get away this time. You know, things have happened in the past. They tried to arrest him before. They tried to grab him before. And it just says, you know, in different passages we read, you know, he just walked away. He just kind of vanished from their presence. He disappeared from among them. He just kind of walked through the crowd and he was gone. And, of course, in John, we repeatedly read he wasn't arrested at those times because his time had not yet come. Again, that control issue, how Jesus, how God the Father is in control of the, every bit of the situation. Although men think they're acting and reacting to the situation, but it's God who's in control. Now, also, they had seen Jesus, you know, work miracles and, you know, do all these different things like that. So they just wanted to be sure they were in control this time. But again, they never realizing that they were never in control. And that's so much of our problem. Is we try to go about our days as if we're in control. And the more we struggle with that, Often the more stressed out we get. But here, they couldn't see that they can't keep God in a religious box. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about understanding and knowing spiritual truth from the scripture and, you know, those parameters. Of course, those are the parameters we look at. Well, how God has revealed himself. But what happens... And what happened with these guys is they came up with a traditional box for God and sought to fit him into that. In contrast, believers are those who have surrendered their lives to the Lord, trusting in God's plan for their lives. Three well-known verses. I mentioned one before, Romans 8, 28. Of course, we know. All things work together for good, for those who love God, for those who are the called according to his purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts 
But I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of good and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Philippians 1.6, for he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it, will be completing it until the day of Christ, until Jesus comes back. Now, Judas gave a sign to those who would arrest Jesus. It was the customary kiss. As you walk up and greet somebody, you kiss them on the cheek there, and he says, greetings, rabbi. The word greetings here means to rejoice, to be well. It's like, oh, bless you, you know, walk up and kiss him on the cheek. And again, Jesus uses, uses this generic title for Jesus, referring to him as rabbi, who could just simply means teacher, and, you know, not really recognizing. Or, and this is what we see here with Judas. Although he was with Jesus these three and a half years, he never actually received or knew Jesus for who he was. So always he's the rabbi. He's the teacher. You know, and you can go and you can listen to a teacher. You can listen to someone and gather information. But it's something different for Jesus to be your Lord. It's to submit yourself under that authority to learn of him, to be trained, if you will, by him, to be changed by him, to allow him to do a work in your life, conforming you into his image. But we don't see that with Judas. He would, again, he was listening, he was doing it, and making a profit on the side as he stole from the money box. Now, there are those commentators, certain ones, who who try to take, in a sense, Judas's side to an extent or try to look at Judas more favorably as if what he was doing was trying to force Jesus into revealing himself. You know, if I just get him arrested, he's going to have to do, you know, do one of those da-da things and here I am and, you know, convince everybody of who he is. I don't see that in Scripture. I really don't see it. I see a man who's conflicted. I see a man who's caught up in his selfishness and his sin and unconverted, even though he's there in the presence of Jesus for three and a half years. And that's something that absolutely floors me. And that's a warning to each one of us, really. Where are we at exactly? Are we trying to, in a sense, handle like Judas did? Are we trying to handle Jesus this in a way that we're comfortable, that still fits into the way we want to live? Or, or are we allowing him to transform our lives? You can't really know Jesus and not be changed. For some people, it might take place slower than others. But that's a serious warning for me. Is that if you see someone who's claimed to receive Jesus and they have no change of lifestyle whatsoever, it's like I would have a hard time offering them assurance of salvation, saying, hey, everything's fine. You went forward and prayed the prayer and, you know, you're good to go. I would have to say, you know, as Paul told the Corinthians, examine yourselves to see if you are of the faith. That's certainly not saying that we're saved by works in any way, but that those things, a change of life, will result from someone who has truly been saved by the grace of God. And Judas goes and kisses Jesus with the kiss of a friend.
In contrast, we saw two weeks ago Mary of Bethany. How she poured that oil of spikenard upon Jesus that was worth a year's wage giving what cost her greatly to worship the Lord. And as we read elsewhere, kissing his feet, just out of giving everything she had to Jesus and pouring her heart out. But here we have Judas, who was actually robbing, as I said, from the till and seeking what was profitable for him. In Luke chapter 22, verse 48, in Luke's account, he says, But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And that's what we see repeatedly as we look in these passages, these accounts of these trials. We see Jesus constantly Pulling the, turning the question around, addressing the people's hearts. As we see, he'll make a statement that's going to cut the person to the quick. Just causing them to think, what are you doing? What are you doing? Know what you're in the middle of. Be aware of what you're doing. Because there are those today even who would betray Jesus with a kiss. On the one hand, paying him lip service, but acting contrary to who Jesus is. Now in verses 50 through 54, we read, but Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him, and suddenly one of those who, who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put away your sword. Put your sword in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to the Father and he'll provide with provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? And again, you see, as with Matthew throughout, it's that attention to this is in fulfillment of the scripture. But again here, Jesus lays Judas' heart bare as he says to him, Why have you come? Judas, why have you come? What are you doing? And then Jesus addresses the crowd according to John 18, verses 4 through 8, asking, Whom do you seek? Who are you looking for? And they respond, Jesus of Nazareth. And then I love this, because this is when Jesus looks at the crowd and says, I am. That's exactly what he said. There was no question in their minds or anyone else's of who he said. And at that point, they all fell over backwards. And you can imagine, let's get the picture, all these guys with, with torches and swords and they're falling over backwards, burning and stabbing one another as they go down. It's like, ooh, oh, you, you know, and they got all of this going on. And there's a kind of a state of confusion there. And at this point, Jesus directs them and tells them, if you want me, let these other guys go. It's like, he's in control here. He's telling them who they can arrest. And then as it says here in this passage, one of his disciples, John readily tells us in John 18, 11, or 10 and 11, that is Peter. 
You know, John and Peter had an interesting relationship. I think they were a little competitive because you notice when John gives the account of the resurrection, they, he talks about how he and Peter raced to the tomb, how they both ran to the tomb, and John mentions, I got there first. But then Peter showed up and he actually walked in, he actually walked into the tomb first. But I was there first. And here we have John, as well as he mentions, oh, the one who cut his ear off, that was Peter. Now, the reason for that is obviously John wrote much later. Probably somewhere around roughly 90 AD. Peter was already gone. He'd already been crucified upside down. There wouldn't be any legal ramifications to him now revealing that it was Peter. So... So he draws the sword, and he cuts off his ear. You know he wasn't going for the ear. He drew, up, drew his sword, which was probably, you know, one of the shorter swords, about that long, and he pulled out and started to swing, and I'm sure Malchus ducked. And so he just got an ear. Peter, again, responds in the flesh because he hadn't prepared himself for the situation. He hadn't prepared himself through prayer. As he was on the Mount of Olives there, as he had that opportunity. If we're not prepared for the ministry that God has for each one of us individually by spending time with the Lord, we're not going to be able to bring to people living water, but we're going to roll around cutting people's ears off. Now it's Luke, the physician, who pays attention to things like that, saying that at this point Jesus heals the guy. You imagine, in the midst of all this, in the midst of this confusion, the guy's ear gets cut off. Jesus walks over, picks up the ear, and sticks it back on. But you see the spiritual darkness in all of this, and it's people, you know, certain people think, well, if we just perform healings and things like that, that people will get saved. That's not the case. Jesus stuck the guy's ear back on the side of his head, and still they arrested him. And he tells Peter, put away your sword. Because those who live by the sword will perish by the sword. Now, this isn't an argument that can be used against the Second Amendment of our Constitution. Because Jesus was the one who told them to take the sword in the first place. Back in Luke chapter 22, verses 35 through 38. He was saying that the times are coming when you need to be serious, prepared, and ready. The problem was that Peter was using the wrong weapon. He was trying to fight the battle that was before him with the wrong weapon. As Jesus says, if he wanted to, he could ask the Father and he would send 12 legions of angels. Just to give you a concept, a little bit of an idea of how many people, how many angels this is and what the situation is here and how much power Jesus had here. We've already established here that the mob could have been somewhere roughly around 600 people in the mob that came to arrest him. A legion 
is 6,000 foot soldiers and 700 horsemen. Multiplying that by 12, you get 80,400 men. Now remember we read in 2 Kings 19.35 that the angel that destroyed the Assyrian army, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Using that number as a standard, these 12 legions of angels could roughly take care of 14 billion 874 million people. Do you think that there would have had a problem? You know, power isn't the point here, but it's the purposes of God that what matters. And Jesus is saying, Don't you think I can send 12, that I can seek the Father? And he would send 12 legions of angels. But then how would the scripture that's there in the prophets be fulfilled? You see, that's the purpose there, fulfilling the plan and the purposes of God. You see, it's God who's getting, the Father who's getting the attention here. It's his purposes that are being accomplished. And that's what we should desire for each one of our lives, is that we're, in, that through our lives, we're fulfilling the plan and purposes of God for our lives. As Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 3, how he presses on towards the mark, that he might attain all that, all that for which Christ Jesus had obtained him, the purpose for which the purposes for which God saved him and chose to use him. He wanted to walk into all of that, and that should be the heart, the drive, if you will, of each one of us. Lord, what do you have my, for my life? I want all of it. I want all of it. Not to be satisfied with anything less, not to be, you know, trying to manipulate things for my own comfort to reinterpret Jesus' words to make myself more comfortable. And if we're aligned with the purpose of God, you'll have all the power of God that you need. All the power from the Lord. And then in verses 55 and 56, we read, In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. The crowd was just doing just that, treating Jesus as a robber. And he says to him, in the days before this, you know, I was in the temple teaching you readily and you didn't arrest me there. And he's really for them painting a clear picture for those who are involved exactly what was taking place for them to look at their hearts and think what are you got doing guys here i am i'm standing you know here you're coming out with swords and clubs and all of this stuff you didn't arrest me then what's the issue here They should have no question of where they stand according to the scriptures, and neither should any of us. Because you see, that's what we need to look at. And that's what's something important for us and an important reason that we stay in the scriptures for ourselves, that we're daily spending time with the Lord, is that he might reveal our heart to us. And then to reveal his heart. that he might show us exactly where, we, where we're coming from, because so often we don't even know ourselves. And then to reveal himself to us and change our hearts.
they, referring to these guys, they either stand with him in the purpose of the God or against him. As Jesus said, those who are not for me are against me. Those who won't gather with me scatter. And that's ultimately what takes place. And when everything seems out of control, weren't working according to plan, the disciples run in fear. Things weren't coming down the way that they thought that they should and they couldn't handle it. Has God ever allowed something to take place or done something in your life that you just couldn't deal with? You had to struggle with. Each of us have those times. And there's those things that we just can't understand. I mean, I can't understand why my first son was stillborn. But what I can do is I don't give up the things I know for the things I don't know, knowing that God loves me incredibly and that he has a purpose for my life and that he takes those circumstances, those situations that we struggle with. And he'll take them and he'll use them for his purpose, for his glory. And knowing that he has all those things in his care. You know, one of the biggest ways I did handle that particular situation. I remember after it had taken place and I was working at the Florida School for the Deaf at the time. And I had another teacher come up to me and, of course, offer his condolence, condolences over, you know, the death of our son. And I just said, I said to him, I'm going to see him again. You see, that's the hope we have in the resurrection. I'm going to see him again. Now, we switch now from Judas. As we see in verses 57 through 68, that the goal here is to convict Jesus of being himself. As we read in verses 57 through 63, it says, And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. I'm not going to deal with that part of it with Peter. We're going to look at Peter next week and cover the whole picture with Peter. So we won't be spending time on that this week, but stay tuned for next week. Continuing here, and he went and sat um, with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, obviously showing what their purpose was here, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify of you? Then Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. 
There were actually five trials that took place that evening and early morning. According to all the gospel accounts, Jesus was first taken to Annas, the high priest that was recognized by the Jewish people. You can see that again in John chapter 18. He was then tried before Caiaphas in the Sanhedrin, which we're looking at now. He was then turned over to Pilate, who sent him to Herod Antipas, we see in Luke 23. And then Herod sends him back to Pilate for the final trial, conviction, and condemnation. But here, with the trial of Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, along with this group of scribes, and these scribes were probably there to try to make everything look legit. You know, it's like, yeah, we're doing this totally illegal thing, but, you know, we're going to go about this process here. Now, some people might find a modern political comparison to this with special prosecutors. I don't want to make those comparisons because I don't want to divert from what we're doing here. But what you see, in my point in even mentioning that, is you see, this is the way people work politically. They can use the law, they can move the law around, and they can ignore the law to do what they want to do. Times and people remain the same. In reality, there was very little that was legal or legitimate about the trial. The intent from the beginning was to find Jesus guilty and execute him. Now, according to Jewish law, that pertains specifically to the Sanhedrin and trials, criminal cases could not be tried during the Passover season which is exactly when this is taking place. Only an acquittal could be issued on the day of the trial. Guilty verdicts had to wait one night to allow feelings of mercy to rise. So you couldn't have a quick one-day trial. All evidence had to be guaranteed by two witnesses who were separately examined and could not have contact with each other. False witness was punishable by death. Obviously, nothing happened to these guys who were false witnesses against Jesus. In fact, they were hired by the Jewish leaders. A trial always began by bringing forth evidence for the innocence of the accused before the evidence of guilt was offered. This obviously didn't happen in Jesus' trial. These were the Sanhedrin's own rules, which they freely and willfully broke in order to try to handle Jesus. Look at our nation today. With many who will do anything to get Jesus out of the public life of our nation. Look at also at those who will do anything to justify keeping Jesus out of their own lives. They tried to get false witnesses together, but they couldn't even get two of them to agree for the most part. And they finally found these two guys who claimed that Jesus said that he would destroy the temple and raise it up in three days. Now, they were obviously misquoting something that Jesus had said after he had cleansed the temple the first time in John chapter 2, verse 19, The the Jewish leaders 
asked Jesus for a sign to show why he did this. And he responded, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And so these false witnesses kind of twisted that statement around, reworking his words, and saying he said he'd destroy this temple and build it in three days. Now, obviously Jesus' statement didn't make sense to them at the time because he was speaking figuratively of his body, as it also says there in John chapter 2. But it's amazing what people will do who don't believe what they'll do with the words of Jesus. How many times have you heard Judge not, lest you be judged. Through people who are living in sin and looking for an excuse to continue to do so. Don't judge me. Bible says you can't judge me. I'm not judging you. The Bible's judging you. I'm just telling you what it says. It's God's word that brings conviction. But even their testimony wasn't cutting it. So the high priest goes to what is essentially for them the nuclear option. He puts Jesus under oath by the living God as to whether he is truly the Messiah, the Son of God. In Leviticus chapter 5 verse 1 it reads, If a person sins, In hearing the utterance of an oath and is a witness, whether he has seen or known of a matter, if he does not tell it, he bears guilt. Caiaphas, what he's trying to do is use a legal maneuver here in in kind of constructing it to the point of saying, if you don't say something, you're denying the living God. And so in that, Jesus responds. As we read here in verse 64, And Jesus said, It is as you said, Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus responds to Caiaphas very simply and directly with an affirmative answer. You said it. Then he tells him what the future is going to hold. Despite the high priest's unbelief and the unbelief of the religious leaders, he's going to come in great power and great glory. He's going to be sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's going to come in the clouds of heaven. Now, people today might deny the gospel and say that God will not judge the world, but it's going to happen just like the Bible says it will. Not a single word will fall to the ground without being accomplished. The high priest might think that he's setting in judgment of Jesus, but he is the one who's actually being judged this day. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, that it was with Caiaphas... And roughly around 35 A.D., when he was deposed, the shame of that and the guilt of the fact that he had had Jesus executed, committed suicide. He was being judged by his actions. Jesus will be sitting at the right hand of the Father, which speaks of his authority As we read in Psalm 110, verse 1, he will be coming in the clouds, which speaks of his power to judge. 
Daniel 7.13. But everyone who seeks to stand in judgment of God and his word is in reality by doing so judging themselves. Because the word of God and the nature of Jesus are solid. They're standing. They're not changing. So every time somebody attacks or makes a statement about it, they're the ones who are being judged according to the standard. The standard doesn't change. And we see this so readily in our society when it seems like anything goes and, you know, you're somehow unloving if you tell somebody that they're living in a sinful lifestyle that's ultimately going to destroy them. The standard still doesn't change. We read in Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I might hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition. It's proof of their perdition. But to you of salvation, and that from God, for to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Excuse me, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. So even, you know, and that's why we're so often attacked as well is just for that reason. Because our lives by our living for the Lord is a conviction to these other people who are not. And no one should ever think that they can contradict God and his word and not, and there, there won't be consequences for it. That reminds me so much of, I think of, you know, the United States so often tries to brag about our own righteousness and, you know, we're the land of the free, the home of the brave, look at, you know, all of this. When we've killed roughly 60 million unborn children and we somehow think that we're not going to be accountable for that? These consequences are true both for us individually and as a, on a national level. Of the remainder of this passage we read, Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witness? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. They, then they spat in his face and beat him and struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? At the declaration of Christ, Caiaphas tears his clothes in response to what he considers blasphemy. It would have been blasphemy if Jesus wasn't exactly who he said he was. But that they weren't willing to accept. That they weren't willing to acknowledge. The high priest, it says there, tore his robes, his garment. But Leviticus 10.6 tells us that the priest robes were not to be torn. In fact, they were designed 
so they wouldn't be torn easily. There was actually, they wore a neck piece around it was made of mail, which is, you know, basically chain link. So they couldn't be torn. So, you know, in tearing them, Caiaphas was really declaring that his office was null and void. It was, was being, at this point in what was taking place, replaced by the eternal priesthood of the one over whom Caiaphas was seeking to stand in judgment. A few hours later, the veil of the temple would be torn from top to bottom, declaring that the very sacrifices they were doing were obsolete, and access to God is granted through the finished work of Christ. In their judgment, they were judging themselves. They all agreed together that Jesus was worthy of death, and they spat on him and slapped him. Luke 22, 63 through 65 tells us that those who guarded him blindfolded him, and they began to beat him and say, prophesy who it is who beat you. The only thing I think automatically every time I read that is I would hate to be those guys when they stand before the throne in judgment it's like all of these guys you hear in unison oops it's like face to face with the one who they spat upon the one they beat and they see standing on the throne or sitting on the throne of eternity in judgment of them. And the question is, the question is raised in the mind is, did they do this because they didn't know who Jesus was or that they were afraid to know who he was? They demonstrated what was in their hearts as they were given the opportunity to spit in the face of God. The truly amazing thing is that in the midst of such hatred for God, God is demonstrating his great love. So Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As Paul expressed when he was giving his testimony in one of, in one of his trials, he makes the statement that I had done many things against the name of Christ. You know, that it was his purpose. He was doing many things, and it repeatedly blew Paul away, thinking that, referring to himself as the greatest of sinners because he persecuted the church. And to experience then the grace of God and to realize that in spite of all he did, God loved him. In spite of all the things I've done in my life, all the sin that I've had, which is all rebellion, in spite of all that I've done, contrary to the name of Jesus, he loves me. He went to the cross for me. He paid the price for my sins and declared on that cross, it is finished. And so from that, we should know and understand the grace of God for our lives. We should realize that if he didn't withhold his own son, 
but freely gave him up for us. Will he not also with him freely give us all things? He's not finished with us yet. He's working in our hearts, in our lives, again, conforming us into his image, using us for his purpose. We're on the one hand, before in our past, we did many things contrary to the name of Jesus, but now he's using us to bring his name glory. What an awesome God we serve. It always blows me away when I think of the fact, and I know I've mentioned it before, but it still blows me away, is that, you know, he saved me. He's working in my life. He's created me in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he prepared beforehand that I should walk in them. So he orchestrates all the work, the works. I do them, and he, re- and, you know, I with the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit that he gives me, and then he rewards me as if I did it. It's like, what's wrong with this picture, Lord? It's grace. It's the love and the mercy of God that he desires to pour out in each one of our lives that we can receive freely, freely through the blood of Christ. So, Rather than trying to handle Jesus, why, rather than trying to work things out on our own, it's our calling, if you will, to surrender. Not to just seek to establish either my own righteousness or my own will, but to surrender. And to have, let him have his way in my life. Knowing, can I, you know, can we just simply trust him? Just that. Simply trust him. For his purposes, for his plan, and for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. And Lord... Uh, each of us would have to confess that at some time in our lives we've tried to do things ourselves the way we think they would be right and usually for our benefit. Lord, you have such better things in mind for us than we could dream up for ourselves. And we simply need to surrender, Lord, to walk with you and to see what you have for each of our lives, Lord God. Your grace is more than sufficient. Your love is unmatched. Your mercies are everlasting. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. As we sing more worship song. So we can go out of here praising the Lord. And then as we do saying and afterwards, if anyone needs any further prayer, feel free to come up. Love to pray with you.